To learn more about earning college credits with study hall courses, go to gostudyhall.com or click the link in the description. Science is the systematic study of the natural world and its processes through observation and experimentation. Essentially, when you science, you test out certain theories or hypotheses to see if you can prove them wrong. In which case, it's time for a new hypothesis. Now you might be thinking, science? Am I in the right place? I thought this was a history course. And it is. We're just getting a little experimental today. See, before the 16th century, our understanding of the world had very little to do with observation or experimentation, meaning it had very little to do with science as we know it today. But everything changed during a crucial period now known as the Scientific Revolution, which transformed how people thought about the natural world. Hi, I'm Rob Fuller, and this is Study Hall, Modern World History. Before we jump into things, while we use the term scientific revolution to refer to this specific period of history in Europe, it's important to note that new schools of thought and discoveries were happening all over the world. The stuff that we think of as part of Europe's scientific revolution couldn't have happened without discoveries made by folks around the world, like advances in mathematics and optics developed in the Middle East. But the discoveries of the 16th and 17th centuries did transform Europe's approach to asking and answering scientific questions. Before the revolution, Europeans relied on two sources to answer their questions about the world. The classics, which were writings by Greek and Roman philosophers and naturalists, and the Christian Bible neither of which was the most complete picture of the scientific world. But during this period, folks began to rely less on these ancient writings and much more on their own observations and application of prior knowledge. In other words, they stopped being literary academics and started to, well, be scientists. And this was due to two new inventions, the microscope and the telescope. Thanks to advances in geometry, humans were now able to grind lenses that allowed them to see the really, really small and the really, really far away. Suddenly, the ability for us to observe these natural phenomena gave humanity the ability to find answers based on, well, observation. And this led to some huge shifts in scientific thinking. At the turn of the 17th century, Sir Francis Bacon, no relation to American sweetheart Kevin Bacon, developed the theory of inductive reasoning, where scientists would make detailed observations and draw conclusions straight from what they saw. Inductive reasoning eventually evolved into the scientific method, which is the foundation of many types of research today and all of my science fair participation ribbons. Around the same time, French scientist René Descartes developed the theory of deductive reasoning, arguing that logic was the source of knowledge rather than observation, which is kind of the opposite of what Bacon was going with, but the main thing is they point towards a way of seeing the world based on human experience rather than religious authority and classical texts. These new approaches to answering some of life's biggest questions led to huge advances in the study of astronomy and the natural world. Before the scientific revolution, navigators and scientists relied on these outdated classical texts to understand nature and stars, particularly books by Aristotle and Ptolemy. So, Basically, a bunch of old, rich, white dudes learning from another group of old, rich, white dudes, and so on. Many classical thinkers argued that the Earth was at the center of the universe, because that just seemed most likely. In their view, space was made of a set of perfect spheres, like a big, giant rainbow jawbreaker. The Earth was at the center of this galactic jawbreaker, and the middle layers carried the planets, the moon, the sun, and then the outermost layers held the rest of the stars. Making this idea work required jumping through some rings, or hoops. Like, Ptolemy had to come up with complex formulas and charts to try and explain things like why planets sometimes look like they're moonwalking, or moving backwards from our perspective. There was also a general belief that the physics of space, or the heavens, was just different than physics on Earth. But the Catholic Church had similar views about Earth, specifically that it didn't move. This is known as the geocentric theory of the universe, and it said that the sun, moon, planets, and everything else in space revolved around us. This geocentric idea came from an interpretation of the Bible and fit with the Christian idea that humanity was God's greatest creation. So the only planet full of humans would, of course, 
be at the center of everything. Or at least the only planet full of humans that we know of. Which definitely isn't true. Today we know that the planets go around the sun, and the sun goes around the center of the galaxy, and there's really no center to the universe, which is… like a whole thing, man. One of the first people to propose that, hey, maybe everything doesn't revolve around the Earth, was a kind of unlikely figure. He was a Catholic clergyman living in Poland in the early 16th century, and his name was Nicholas Copernicus. His main focus was developing a better calendar, but that required studying the sun and moon, and while he was doing that, he started to have doubts about Ptolemy's geocentric ideas. Instead, after observing the stars and planets on his own, Copernicus came to believe the Sun was at the center of the universe. This is known as the heliocentric theory, and it was much closer to the truth. But despite having worked on it for years, Copernicus just sat on this revelation until he died in 1543. And for him, personally, maybe that was for the best. When Copernicus's work was published in 1543, Catholic and Protestant authorities rejected his idea because it challenged their interpretation of the Bible. Copernicus even got on the Vatican's banned book list, which was a pretty hot list to be on. Meanwhile, other scientists still struggled with his idea because, well, it just didn't work. Not just because the Sun isn't the center of the universe, but because Copernicus was still rolling with that whole the universe is a giant galactic jawbreaker idea from Ptolemy. He still assumed everything moved in circles, even though that didn't match what he saw in the sky. Remember that whole science based on observation inductive reasoning thing? Well, Copernicus had only gotten about halfway there. But in science, getting halfway there is still a huge deal. Living on a prayer, baby. The thing about science is, we only know what we currently know, and we're constantly learning more. Something that was once a huge discovery can be looked back on as totally incorrect, but still an important part of scientific history, and a crucial step to future knowledge. Such was the case with Copernicus. Even though his heliocentric theory wasn't totally correct, it was closer. And most importantly, it got other scientists thinking. In the late 16th century, Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe made observations of his own, developing complex instruments to look at space. Then, German astronomer Johannes Kepler built on Brahe's data and made huge revelations in the early 17th century. Among other things, he figured out that the planets didn't orbit in perfect circles, they traveled in ovals. And another hundred years after that, Sir Isaac Newton began to figure out why planets moved like they did, building on the discoveries of Copernicus, Brahe, and Kepler, not to mention all the important advances in mathematics. Turns out, the same force that keeps our feet on the ground keeps planets tethered to stars, and a planet's mass affects the shape of its path around the Sun. In other words, the physics of the heavens and the Earth aren't different after all. But this wasn't the easiest idea for society to swallow. Just ask Galileo. Galileo, 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 Galileo Figaro. Galileo Galilei was an astronomer who lived right before Newton in the early 17th century, and he's become so famous, he's usually just called Galileo, like Zendaya or Beyonce. In fact, Galileo was the queen bee of astronomy and the first person to use a telescope to study the heavens. And with this superior view, he discovered Jupiter has moons, and our moon has mountains. And what's that? Oh man, there are spots on the sun too? <laughs> Just make sure you don't look too close yourself. But these discoveries didn't jive with the Catholic Church, who was more or less running the show in Europe at the time. The Church was fully on the there are no imperfections in the heavens bandwagon, so sunspots? Moon mountains? Definitely not. It also didn't help that Galileo was big into debating the Earth isn't the center of the universe, even after the Church warned him he'd be accused of heresy if he kept going, a threat Galileo ignored and which eventually landed him under house arrest until he died in 1642. And there was no Netflix back then either to pass the time. Now, people weren't just asking questions about space during this period. There was also tons of exploration and new knowledge about things like gases and vacuums and zoology that became a huge part of the scientific revolution in the 16th and 17th century. We just don't have space in this episode to cover them all. 
See what I did there? And this new knowledge didn't just impact Europeans. Like we mentioned, although the scientific revolution is the historical term we use to describe this particular period in Europe, these advances wouldn't have been possible without previous discoveries by people from all over the world. Garcia de Orta was a 16th century Portuguese scientist who traveled to India, where he observed the native flora as well as mingled with locals and travelers alike. Did I mention he could also speak at least four languages? Based on these conversations and experimentation, he authored a book titled Conversations on the Simples, Drugs, and Medicinal Substances of India, which not only detailed the medicinal uses of many local plants, but also outlined symptoms of diseases like cholera. With the help of his international buddies, he was also able to shed light on medical misinformation floating around Europe at the time. Similarly, indigenous Americans passed off important medical knowledge to the European colonizers, including a life-saving anti-malarial. See, the bark from the native chinchona tree contains quinine, which is still used today to treat malaria. And the Ottoman and Mughal empires had a long history with astronomy as well. In 1577, Ottoman polymath Taki al-Din built the Constantinople Observatory and used his observations to produce star catalogs. But just as these discoveries were rejected by devout Catholics within Europe, not all global empires were ready to talk science. For instance, in China, a sect of Catholic monks called the Jesuits still served as the emperor's astronomers up until 1805. And when clocks measuring minutes and seconds were offered to the emperor of Japan, he politely declined, saying that clocks and the idea of fixed time just weren't useful in Japan. They were doing just fine measuring time based on the position of the sun, thank you very much. Ultimately, it took decades for the scientific revolution to make its way around the globe. And even within Europe, it took time for these ideas to spread. Notably, it took until 1835 for Copernicus's work to be rescued from the church's banned book list and be acceptable reading. Just, you know. 200 plus years after the fact. Does this mean there's hope for 1984? The scientific revolution brought about huge advances in our understanding of space and the natural world, and also challenged the power of institutional religion, which was premier in Europe at the time. But it's not like we knew everything all at once. The scientific revolution itself took centuries, and we're still learning today. Still, the idea that we can explain the world around us through observation and experimentation, as well as the fact that things can be explained, is crucial to our understanding of the world today. But who knows? Maybe some scientist, somewhere, someday, will make new discoveries that blow the socks off of everything we know to be fact today. And to them I say, Viva la Revolution! If you're enjoying Study Hall Modern World History and are interested in taking online courses and earning college credit, go to gostudyhall.com or click this button to learn more. Thanks for watching. See you next time.